Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Lori Kaplan, President and CEO of the Latin American Youth Center. The Latin American Youth Center has been committed to transforming the lives of low-income young people and their families for 45 years. Lori has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Lori, for joining us today. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. So the demographic shifts in this country are very significant mm -hmm. and are oft reported. Talk about the founding of the Latin American Youth Center 45 years ago and how the Latin American Youth Center is transforming itself today to meet the needs of youth coming into the, to this Washington, D.C. area. Great. Well, 45 years ago, we were beginning to see in and around Washington, D.C., an emerging immigrant community very different than San Antonio or New York or Miami. This was a new community, a recent community, not generations and generations of families. The original immigrant community to Washington were, was very much Caribbean, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Panamanians, and out of that moment, the seeds for the youth center were planted actually by young people who themselves and their families saw a need to have a place where kids could come, where they could uh, feel welcomed, a home away from home, but also feel a sense of um, a place where, where they could learn new skills, learn English, and it was out of that moment with the recent immigrant community in, in the decade of the late 60s, early 70s that the Youth Center was born. And from its beginning, the uh, the Hispanic Latino community here in, in this area was incredibly diverse. When you talk about uh, people coming from the Caribbean area, mm -hmm. you're talking about different cultures, different mm -hmm. sensibilities, uh, bound together by perhaps a common language, but still, even in small, there was a, an incredible diversity of sensibility. Well, that's true. I mean, from the inception, there were Afro-Latinos, Latinos, but I think it's really, you can't understand the history of the youth center without putting it in the context of the history of the immigration patterns into this country. And in the early years, the original um, Latinos very much carried the profile of an immigrant. They had left their country of origin in search of better economic, social, and uh, educational opportunities. But then as time went on, and particularly as we got into the mid-70s, late 70s, early 80s, that profile changed a great deal. And that's when the, um, it was in 1979 when Nicaragua went to the Sandinistas and a civil war broke out in El Salvador. And lots and lots of Salvadoran youth started coming into Washington, D.C. And actually, D.C. had the largest number of Salvadorans after LA. This was a region that they migrated to. So their profile was very, very different than the early, early immigrants that came back in the late 60s. And they really were refugees, but in great part were not given refugee status. So they were coming traumatized from the war. They were coming with very minimal educational experiences. And that also began to change the demographic trends in this region. How were you able to ride that wave of emotion and tension and, and Well, need? honestly, there was some tension in the context of the Latino community because the leadership had been very um, based sort of in the Puerto Rican community. Yes. And then as the Salvadorans started coming, they themselves were forming organizations in the, and um, some, a new community of, of services and supports emerged. I would say that the tensions were not that great between the uh, Central American community and the um, Caribbean community, in great part because they shared a common bond, which was the language, albeit with some differences, of course, in, in uniqueness to the region. But more importantly, everyone was trying to acculturate into a community that in many ways was ill-prepared to integrate into the schools into the social service systems, into the housing systems. So they shared that bond of needing to unify together to really address some of the social and economic problems 
that they were faced with as kids were flooding the schools and as the housing market was changing, em employment opportunities. So, um, Deconstruct some of those issue issues for us because uh, you have the linguistic issues mm -hmm. in the schools which are uh, pretty clear, but, but talk a little bit more about the issues that new immigrants faced and that people who were already here, who already had navigated mm -hmm. those uh, issues, um, how that actually functioned and how the center and the community surrounding the center uh, provided the support that was required. Well, in the very, very early years, young people would walk, and the, the youth center was small. I mean, it was a neighborhood, grassroots. Kids would walk in, ride their bike. Kids were kind of running the place. It's very different than you know what it is today, although kids still have a major voice, and many of our employees are young people who grew up at the center. And you have a range of supportive services Oh, we now have a wide, wide range. We've grown from this little teeny grassroots sort of elbow grease thing to a multi-service, multi-site. We've founded charter schools. We've run business. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful journey over the 45 years. But to answer your question, in the very early years, kids would walk in and they really were work, looking for three things. They wanted a place to hang out and have fun and be able to share their culture, a home away from home, a second home. They wanted to learn English, so they needed educational supports, and many of them wanted to work. They wanted some extra money. Their parents were not people with expendable income, so the kids wanted to contribute to the well-being of the family. Washington's always been a pretty expensive region to, to live in, even though that's even you know, more um, pressing today. So the kids would walk in, that's what they were looking for. So we started with educational programs, after school activities, cultural events, and then as the Salvadoran youth started coming in, we needed programs for homeless kids, we needed mental health programs, we needed many more social service programs, legal supports, and then as the years went on, we needed an array of job training, and, 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 and it's really been a story of responding to the changing needs of the community around us. It's really not about just doing the same old thing year after year and never changing. We're sort of always ever changing because the needs of the community and the region around us change, but what never changes is the values, the mission, the purpose, sort of what we call our salsa. And that's what young people and families have, have really integrated into over the years. In that period, it wasn't just the youth center. Uh, the seeds were planted for an array of organizations that eventually became sort of the nonprofit fabric that wrapped themselves around the lives of these new immigrants. A legal agency, a health center, a daycare center, a social services center. But the youth center always had the focus of the young people and respected their voice and welcomed them in. And it was tiny, it still got those same values, now we're just a lot bigger. How many people uh, take advantage of the youth center uh, on an annual basis and, and your various programs? Well, over 4,000 kids w walk through the multiple doors of our centers and sites every year now. And in addition to that, we founded three charter schools which were designed to re-engage kids that had dropped out of schools. So that probably represents about another 600 kids. We were seeing demographic uh, shifts and changes about 10 years ago. And as the subway system in D.C. Uh, advanced, we were definitely seeing people move up the corridors into suburban Maryland and northern Virginia. So we opened in, southern, in, in suburban Maryland about 10 years ago. And a third of our young people now come from Montgomery and Prince George's counties. And we're just getting ready in the fall Your to open plans. up in Arlington. In Arlington. Because we really are a region. Having said that, we were dealing with different governments, with different leadership, with different political systems. But the youth center has been able to expand throughout the region. In terms of the diverse services that you supply, mm -hmm. could you deconstruct some of the services that you supply sure. to youth? We really families? have, I would say, three big buckets. One is education. So for the kids that are in school, we want them to stay there. We're providing tutoring and after-school activities and in-school support. We actually go into the schools and work with the kids during the school day. 
For the kids that are out of school, we're very focused on getting them back in. We want all of our young people to get on an educational pathway. So we do a lot of work also with vocational training, um, with the getting into college, staying in college, the support you need to get there. So there's a big package of programming around education. And this ranges from conventional uh, programs that, that any child would have uh, to, uh, to other programs that focus on uh, children, the specific needs of children living in poverty or uh, Well, linguistic. I would say all of our kids are low income. Very few of the young people are, um, I mean, we're trying to get them out of poverty into middle class, uh, but pretty much at the time they walk in the door, they're low income. Many of them are dealing with a multiplicity of what the literature considers risk factors. They could be dealing with um, family issues, they could right. be dealing with homelessness, teen parenting, substance abuse issues, a lot of mental health issues, depression, um, juvenile justice issues. Others don't have all those risk factors, but they still are stuck in poverty with parents that are you know, barely keeping the lights on and the rent paid, and they need a place where they can get the extra supports that too often, because their parents are working multiple jobs, are not around to do it. Um, our programs are free, you know, we're, we're, but what we really want is that all kids who walk through, well, we want all kids, but particularly the ones that walk through our doors, to successfully transition into young adulthood with a career focus, educational pathway, a healthy lifestyle, health and wellness, and really not being stuck in poverty. And one of the things that makes me the happiest, because I've worked there for 35 years, is that I've seen you know, more than a generation of young people grow up. And now I see these young people as parents and family members. Our alumni are fused throughout the fabric of our region. And I feel so happy because they really have accomplished so much um, you know, in, in their own lives. And do your alumni engage in, in sustaining the center and in volunteering? The alumni are very engaged and people just stay in touch with us. It really is a home away from home for so many. We have an associate board and that's a lot of alumni. Um, you know, they become foster parents, they, they volunteer, they tutor, they serve on our board of directors. Um, they work at different places, so they're always calling me and saying, Lori, what does the youth center need? You know, how, I'm, I'm working in this job now, or I'm at the White House, or I'm at the Department of Employment Services, you know, what can I do? Because almost to the person, what they will tell you is that the youth center made a huge, huge difference in their lives. And often it was the programs, but most often it was the people. It was the relationships that evolved over their, throughout their years at the youth center that mentored them, that guided them, that supported them, that kind of never gave up on them, that didn't see them as a problem to be fixed, but just saw them as a wonderful resource who needed some extra services and supports and opportunities to, to sort of move along there to hit their goals. So it's education, it's, we do a lot with job training. Uh, we run a conservation corps, we have an AmeriCorps program and we recruit heavily from our own community so that those kids can then springboard and become teachers and social workers. Um, we do a lot with healthy lifestyles, choices, you know, prevention, um, all kinds of after school program. Plus we do things that are fun, arts and music and recreation and trips and it's really, um, there's a lot of energy inside the sites of the youth center. How does your funding work? Well, our funding, <laughs> I guess that's the part that's uh, often for many of us. Uh, we, this year we have a, a $14 million budget. About 60% of that is a diverse set of city, state, federal contracts. The other 40% is corporate, foundation, individual, special events, but always, you know, the fundraising is an ongoing activity. So when you say corporate foundation special events, mm -hmm. you're talking about a mix of about mm -hmm. six, for about 60% of your funding, uh, which is about $8 million, mm -hmm. is government and 40% mm -hmm. is contributed? Mm -hmm. And of the government, that's a multiplicity of, of, of contracts and grants. Right. So it's for foster care or housing the homeless or 
um, so job it's tied training. to specific services Very that you provide. Tied. Yes. And and so we tried to piece all these disparate funding sources together to work with a young person, not in a piecemeal way. Right. In terms of of the staff that you attract, are you primarily attracting staff from the community, or do you or, or do you recruit from outside of the community? We do both. Um, you know, and we really want the staff to uh, be a part, feel reflective of the kids walking in. And today, 45 years later, about 55 percent of the kids we work with are from different Latino nationalities, and the other 40, 45 percent are African American, and Asian, and diverse. So the staff really reflects that. And many of the staff, we love to hire staff from the community. Um, some of them have left the community, gone to college, and come back. Come back. We love to hire our, our alumni. Um, but we also love outside people because they bring ideas and energy. And, um, you know, there's probably staff from 30 different countries represented, multiplicity of languages. It's, I would think it's the most diverse youth and family development center in the metropolitan region. There's an awful lot of debate these days in this country about immigration reform mm -hmm. and immigration issues. Um, the uh, the fact that uh, so many people living here who are making a contribution are also undocumented mm -hmm. uh, immigrants. Uh, does this affect you and your programs? It does. Um, you know, the last time we ever had any real immigration form was 1986 with right. the Reform and Control Act. And that did um, get certain families that, at this center and in our region on a pathway towards legal status and citizenship. Along the way, there's been little things like temporary protective status and now DACA, which gives the kids the right to go to college. And you know, the Dreamer movement has really, you know, been a very important to our region. But overall, I think the immigration issue just sits on our community. If you're not on a pathway to citizenship, if you don't have your green card, it really does frame in, in great respect the opportunity to move from poverty, to get out of the shadow, to not be worried about family separation. So, you know, we're just holding every, every year we're waiting for immigration reform. We had hoped for it under the Bush administration because actually uh, the former president was an advocate of immigration reform, but in the end couldn't get it through. We know our current president is an advocate for immigration reform, but it's been stalled. So that very much affects the quality of life issues for a certain segment of our population, not the entirety, because of course now we're dealing with a lot of kids that were born here. What is, does the future hold? for this uh, youth center that has been around for 45 years yeah. and still has a, has a major contribution to make as you expand yeah. into Northern Virginia and, and, and other areas in the region? Well, I think the youth center has another 45 years right in front of it and the, the opportunities are endless. You know, the demographics are just popping in this region. So the, the Latino community is, is growing, it's gonna continue to grow, and politically it's gonna make a bigger difference soon in this region. You're already seeing an array of elected officials, you know, in Montgomery County, Latino. But even more than, than, than that, I think, you know, as the region grows and changes, our nation is only as good as we can educate our children and prepare our children for leadership roles and responsibility because they are going to become the adults. And I think that, um, the Youth Center gets calls constantly about replicating some of our work, our models In nationally. Other communities. Yeah, I'm not saying that we would open youth centers across our country, but there's definitely things that we're doing, both nationally and internationally, that people are very interested in. Just this year alone, we've probably had international visitors from over 30 different countries. We've, we've got partnerships with some countries in Latin America. Yesterday, there were 30 co um, principals and um, teachers, all from El Salvador, spending two days at the Youth Center. So I think in the future, 
we'll be trying to push out some of what we've learned in the last 45 years that others can value and take advantage of while we continue expanding and growing our direct practice here in this region. There's a lot of interest in our, um, some of our charter school models also because they're re-engaging kids that have fallen through the cracks of other systems. And so um, we're getting a lot of visitors to our LAYC Career Academy, which, which um, to graduate from our Career Academy, you have to have your high school credential, you have to have a vocational credential, mm -hmm. and you have to compl have completed at least six hours of college credit. So we're doing dual immersion. So we're doing a lot of wonderful things and innovative things. A great, great contribution mm -hmm. to the fabric of this mm -hmm. region, to Thank the you. economic fabric, to the yeah. social fabric of this region mm -hmm. and, and to the nation. The Latin American Youth Center is, is doing such wonderful work. Thank Roy you. Kaplan, thank you so much thank for sharing you. your experience and thank you for your insights. Yeah, you're welcome.